Bonjour à tous et à toutes et bienvenue à cette euh, édition de la conférence du mardi de Math Physique. Welcome to the Math Physics Seminar Series. Um, cette semaine, c'est mon plaisir d'accueillir euh, des membres de mon groupe. En fait, Stéphane Vinet qui a gradué sa maîtrise, qui est rendu à Waterloo, qui fait son doctorat là-bas. Et Gabriel Lompré qui termine présentement sa maîtrise dans mon groupe. Et euh, aussi en parallèle, un, prof, un poste de prof au cégep. Euh, cégep de? Paul Boulogne. Paul Boulogne, c'est ça. Merci. Et euh, donc, Gabriel a fait son bac à l'UDM, tandis que Stéphane a fait son, son bac à Chicago, University of Chicago. Et euh, ben c'est ça, ils sont experts de, de ce sujet-là et d'autres sujets que je ne connais pas, mais ce sujet-là en particulier. Uh, donc, on va avoir un séminaire spécial where today uh, the two speakers will uh, give one talk, not at the same time. So, it will be a classical seminar. It will be uh, one after the other, more or less. Donc, uh, um, they will tell us today about their master's project, projects, uh, which is about some interesting quantum spin chains. Um, and uh, their relation to some non-equilibrium classical dynamics, a theme that we have seen a few times by this point at the CRM. So um, please uh, take the floor, Stéphane and Gabriel. Uh, well, now it's thank you. Uh, 3.35, so roughly uh, one hour total. Uh, so until 4.35 then. Please uh, let some time for the questions. Perfect. Thank you, William, for inviting us and introducing us. Um, today, most of our talk will be about the results shown, shown in our last article and in uh, uh, Stefan Master thesis and my future master thesis. Um, and the article has the same name as the presentation. We will first be talking uh, about two critical quantum spin chains that we will introduce to you. The first is the Kawasaki spin chain, which is obtained from Kawasaki dynamics on a classical Ising chain. And the second one is the Fredkin spin chain, which was introduced by Solberger and Koripin as a half integer version of another chain, the Modskin spin chain. The Fredkin spin chain is characterized by a large entanglement scaling. With, uh, with those two chains, we'll use the BT and ZAP um, to obtain the spin wave solutions for the one and two magnon sectors. And using those solutions, we will study the two magnon dispersion continuums. And then we will present the uh, dynamical exponents of both spin chains in different regimes. And we will show that they host multiple dynamics. Finally, we will uh, introduce the Berry-Tabor conjecture and how to use it. And we'll, using it, we will claim that both spin chains are not integrable. So I'll leave to you uh, with Stefan. Okay, so we start with a classical Ising spin chain and we know the Ising model has no intrinsic dynamics. It is a static model. So we couple the spin chain to a heat bath of temperature T which induces energy differences and state transitions in the system. In order to study stochastic processes under conserved total magnetization, we adopt Kawasaki dynamics, which only allows for spin exchanges as depicted at the bottom of this slide here, where the ith and ith plus one spins are exchanged. The corresponding transition probability rate is um, W here and depends on the Ising energy difference between our two configurations S and S prime. Now, moving on to the next slide and transitioning towards the quantum picture, we exploit um, the correspondence between the non-equilibrium dynamics of certain classical systems and the dynamics of closed quantum systems. In particular, we interpret the Markov master equation as a Schrodinger equation evolution in imaginary time and construct a pseudo Hamilton H of C here. The diagonal and non-diagonal matrix elements of the result resulting Hamiltonian can then be expressed in terms of our transition probability rates W um, from the previous slide. 
However, the correlated exchange terms and the non-diagonal elements lead to a non-symmetric operator. And so we use a non-unitary similarity transformation S in order to symmetrize the Hamiltonian. Now, we obtain on the next slide the following Hamiltonian. It consists of a diagonal term in the first line and the non-diagonal exchange term in the second line. And it is a four local interaction and depends on kappa, which is the Ising coupling normalized by the bath's temperature. Note that we impose periodic boundary conditions on um, our spin chain and that at kappa equals to zero, we recover the Heisenberg XXX model. In our other limit where kappa is equal to infinity, the Hamiltonian takes the form of these folded spin one half XXZ model with an extra diagonal term. On the next slide, we have the Fredkin model, which on the other hand consists of a three local interaction and considers the following exchanges. Um, note that we have uh, depicted them in two different notations. Um, the parentheses notation uh, maps an open parentheses to an upspin and a closed parentheses to a uh, downspin. And so we, we consider um, the exchanges of up, down, down to down, up, down, and vice versa, as well as the second one, up, up, down to um, up, down, up. And so um, as Gabriel mentioned, um, the Fritkin model was introduced by Corippen and Salberger as a spin one half version of the Motzkin spin one chain. It can be expressed in terms of Fredkin gates, hence the name, or alternatively given in terms of Pauli spin operators as we present here. Traditionally, the boundary terms are set such that the first spin is in the down position and the last spin is in the up position as given by this boundary term here. However, we will opt for periodic boundary conditions from here on out. Now, on the next slide, we have a few- uh, I have a quick question uh, on the previous slide. Yeah. So, in terms of the parentheses representation at the top, this means that whenever you have like a closed closed pair, which is you know left and right parentheses together, this can move across you know other parentheses, mm -hmm. right? That's the the basic motion that's allowed in this model, right? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so here are uh, so some, some symmetries of the Kawasaki quantum spin chain. Um, we have that the total Z spin is preserved as well as translational symmetry. In addition, we also have time inversion um, symmetry and space inversion symmetry. Now for the Fredkin model, um, the first two symmetries are again symmetries of um, the, the system that is uh, translational and total Z spin. But um, we must combine time inversion and space inversion in order to form a symmetry of the uh, Fredkin spin chain. And so we'll use the first two symmetries in order to block diagonalize our Hamiltonian um, with quantum numbers um, SZT for the total spin and um, K for the momentum. And so um, we can look at the um, ground states of the Kawasaki spin chain. And in the classicalizing spin chain, uh, there is a thermodynamic equilibrium probability distribution in each spin subsector. And these distributions are given by um, Boltzmann distributions. And from them, we can obtain a corresponding quantum state in each total uh, Z spin subsectors. We have um, N plus one sub such subsectors, we will obtain um, N plus one such states. And here the quantum state is labeled by the, at the bottom here, uh, by the um, sigma Z eigenvalues, and we can obtain the ground states by applying the similarity transformation S, which we used a few slides ago in, in order to obtain the Hamiltonian. And we then find a ground state with uh, momentum and energy zero in each spin subsector. And um, finally, let me just point out for this slide that ZJ here, our normalization, corresponds to the partition function restricted to the magnetic, magnetization sector J. And so similarly for the Fredkin model on the next slide, if we consider periodic boundary conditions, there is a ground state in each total Z spin subsector and they all have momentum and energy zero. In fact, they correspond to the ground state of the Heisenberg XXX model. 
And hence, they were given by symmetric combinations of sigma z eigenstates, that is, states in the classical basis. Here are normalization factors sj and can be computed as the binomial coefficient of the number of magnons with the length of the spin chain. And um, for even n, so for even spin chain length, there is an extra anomalous ground state with uh, momentum k equals to pi. Its exact formula is quite involved and is given in the reference below. But if we rather use fixed boundary conditions, as is done in most of the literature, the ground state degeneracy is lifted, and the remaining ground state is the symmetric combination of big states. That is, um, again, states that respect the parentheses rule. And hence, as we can see um, in this example for n equals to 6, we have that um, the total z spin of the ground state is of 0. And so, Moving on to the Bethéon zuts on the next slide, it is useful to consider every downspin as a quasi-particle and the spin with and the, and the state with all spins up as um, the vacuum. And we will represent the positions of uh, these magnons, which in our case are our quasi-particles, as n i for i ranging from one through um, r in the r magnon zut sector. And using the rotational symmetry of the z space and spin space, z axis and spin space, as well as the translational symmetry, we can write any state psi in the following form. And then our goal for characterizing these um, R magnon subsector is really reduced to calculating these coefficients A of n. And um, we will do this um, in the following slides for the one and two magnon sector. But the central idea of the Bethian Zatz is that for eigenstates with more than one quasi particle, we consider the regions in the configuration space where the quasi particles are separated from each other. And so as the interaction is of short reach, we can assume that in these regions, the quasi particle do not interact and can thus be described as a superposition of plane waves. For this slide, in fact, in the one magnon sector, things are even simpler as the translational symmetry completely diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. And so we can write any state psi as a linear combination of eigenvectors of our translation operator with associated eigenvalue one minus cosine of k, the impulsion, which is, or the momentum, which is equal to two pi m over n with m ranging from zero to n minus one. And so, um, taking uh, the leading term in the Taylor expansion of this energy function, we find a critical exponent from the cosine term of z equals to two. Now, on the next slide in the two magnon sector, we work in the center of mass frame with relative coordinate j equals to n2 minus n1. That is the difference in positions of our two magnons and total momentum capital K. We impose, again, periodic boundary conditions on this ansatz and obtain the following uh, condition. And then substituting this ansatz into our time independent Schrodinger equations, we'll obtain a system of n over two linear equations, um, assuming that n is even. In the other case, we would have n minus one over two equations. Um, and so we call these equations the Bethe equations. And um, on the next slide, you can see our Bethe equations for the Kawasaki quantum spin chain. Um, without getting too much into the details of these equations, I just want to remark a few things, namely that we have particular equations for the cases of j is equal to 1 and j is equal to 2, and these correspond to nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor configurations of magnons. And then we have a general case for um, j greater than or equal to 3. The case where j is equal to n over 2 actually stems from um, the periodic boundary conditions, and in the case of m is odd, we will find um, an overcount due to this equation as it is trivially satisfied. So um, we'll remove uh, this equation from our set of uh, Bethe equations in order to solve our system. Similarly for Fredkin in the next slide. Uh, uh, Stefan, could you uh, come back to the previous slide? And yep. what's, what's G again? J, J is the difference in positions of the two magnons. Okay, so is that one of the variable that you, one of the unknown? Um, no, J is, is not unknown in the sense it's based, we're, we're taking J to be, um, right, like- in Marine, our... uh, Yvan, do you mean uh, J or J? J, oh, J, yeah, in, J. J in English. Yeah, so the, the G in English, Stefan. Oh, G is unknown. 
Yeah, J G is unknown. I should be saying J. Sorry, J. Yeah, okay. sorry. That's the okay. confusion. Okay, yeah. So G okay. and so, so yes. the, these are the beta variables. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And E is also unknown at this point. E is also unknown at this point. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So again, here for g equal to one and two will obtain distinct equations and in fact for g greater than or equal to three we have the um same equation as for um the kawasaki um case but with um a factor of eight on the right hand side and so we want to um better understand these equations for g1 and g2 and in order to do so, we'll introduce a fidelity measurement on the next slide, in particular, a nearest neighbor fidelity measurement, which corresponds to the probability to measure a given state psi in a uh, nearest neighbor configuration as defined um, in this nearest neighbor states where our two magnons are on positions n1 and n2, n2 being equal to um, n1 plus one modulo n. And note that the fidelity is equal to um, the modulus squared of our G1 term. Um, similarly, we could define the next nearest neighbor fidelity and uh, we would have that it is equal to our G2 term. And so um, solving the Bethe equations, we can plot on the next slide, the energy spectrum as a function of the total momentum K and obtain our two magnon continuums. We have done this on the left here for the Heisenberg spin chain which corresponds to the kappa equals to zero limit of the Kawasaki um, model that we study. And on the right for the Fredkin spin chain, we also characterize the nearest neighbor fidelity via a color plot ranging from zero green to one purple. And um, let me just note also that uh, the Ising energy of the state is directly related to the number of domain walls um, via the following relation. And so generally two magnon configurations correspond to four domain walls. However, nearest neighbor configurations correspond to two domain walls and thus require intermediate states with a larger number of domain walls in order to propagate. And so the nearest neighbor configurations thus have a lower number of um, domain walls and, and consequently at lower energy and thus survive as bound states. And this is what we observe in the continuum on the left here as we have um, a two magnon scattering states that can, in our continuum here, and a lower branch of two magnon bound states. Additionally, on the right, we actually have an upper branch of states, um, and these are characterized by um, a 3070 distribution of nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor uh, configurations. And the um, bottom branch here is going to be a 70 uh, 30 split. And so um, this upper branch really comes from our our next nearest neighbor interactions, especially in the case of the Kawasaki expansion, which we'll see in the next slide um, and for, for the ferromagnetic regime. Uh, Stefan, just a quick question about the Fretkin upper branch yeah. of bound states that's absent for the XXX integrable model. Um, so here the color is hard to see. So what's the nearest neighbor fidelity on the upper branch? Uh, it's about 30%. It's 30%. Okay. Yeah. And the the rest of the weight you say is yeah, is next next neighbor. next. It's, it's not the nearest, it's the one yeah. where they're separated by one. Exactly. Between. Yeah. And it's ferro or anti ferro the configuration. Uh, the next nearest neighbor? Yeah, the one that's further. It's uh it is ferro, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, so on the next slide for the Kawasaki model, um, things are simpler. The lower branch is very close to fidelity one and um, for, for nearest neighbor. And the upper one is um, very close to fidelity one for next nearest neighbor. And we can see that um, the shape of the continuum is unchanged as we tune kappa from zero to 0 0.5 to um, infinity, implying that it is independent of kappa. But the seams themselves, and particularly the branch states, um, are affected. 
In fact, um, as we tune towards kappa, we can see that the lower branch tends towards our ground state. In fact, at kappa equals to zero, um, our states are of energy zero. Um, and on the next slide in the antiferromagnetic regime, the branch states have a more intricate behavior. Um, as kappa becomes negative, anti-alignment of spins is favored, which leads to the nearest neighbor branch being pushed into higher energies and the next nearest neighbor branch becoming energetically favored and moving below the continuum. And the collision between the two branches happens at kappa x here on the bottom left figure around minus 0 0.27 where the two branches actually cross, indicating there's no level repulsion between our two branches. Additionally, at this value of kappa x, the fidelity of the two branches is identical. So for, for strong interactions, the quasi-particle is pushed outside of the continuum as a consequence of level repulsion, as we can see at minus um, 0 0.17. Uh, and one would expect that as the interaction starts weakening, as kappa tends towards minus infinity, that the bound state would decay when encountering the continuum, which is in fact what we observe at minus 31, 0 0.31 on the bottom right here. However, on the next slide, as we can see, as the coupling further decreases, the bound state becomes further lived throughout the continuum, as here at minus 0 0.6. In fact, at uh, kappa equals to um, minus infinity on the right here, we have a pure bound state with fidelity one and energy two traversing the continuum. And this is due to the fact that the weaker interactions actually lead to a higher fidelity and a lower perturbation with the rest of the continuum. And um, let me add also that uh, from the shape of the continuum, which is quadratic, we can deduce that the critical exponent for this subsector is of z equals to two. And now I will let uh, Gabriel touch on more of details of these dynamical critical exponents. Thank you, Stefan. So I'll now be talking about the dynamical exponents um, in most critical systems that is uh, systems where the first energy will go to zero as, as we get an increasing uh, chain length, the gap will normally, well, most of the time scale as the inverse of a power of the chain length. That power is the dynamical exponent or critical exponent. The gap is the difference between the ground state and first excited state. However, for our two chains, the energy of the ground state being zero, the gap will simply correspond to the first ex the energy of the first excited state. In Greenberg's paper cited below, um, on the Kawasaki spin chain, the global dynamical exponent was evaluated using exact diagonalization on small systems with periodic boundary conditions. And here we can see on the x-axis that is t over j, which is inversely proportional to our kappa because our kappa is j uh, times beta, which is inversely proportional to temperature. And we can see that the exponent will vary on that axis when uh, it is two when kappa is equal to zero. So on the right side here, uh, which corresponds to the uh, Eisenberg spin chain. And we can see that it rises and goes over three when kappa goes to infinity on the left. Accounting for finite size fx uh, for his small systems, Greenberg will obtain an exponent close to 3.1 at large kappa. However, um, the literature and the dynamic of the corresponding classical spin chain that Stefan talked about uh, suggests that the dynamical exponent in the weakly polarized sectors should rather be 3 than 3.1. Um, by weakly polarized, I mean uh, a low total z spin in absolute value. For the Fredkin spin chain, we did the same kind of computation. So we computed the spectrums using exact diagonalization on small spin chains, again with periodic boundary conditions. And for the Fredkin spin chain, the first excited state isn't in the lowest non-zero momentum sector. So it's not at low momentum, unlike for the Eisenberg and Kawasaki spin chains. Its momentum for the Fredkin spin chain is rather close to pi. It's exactly pi for even length spin chains, and it's the momentum right next to it for odd length spin chains. And looking at the graphs, of the first energy versus the chain length, we can see that they both follow a power law, but they have different exponents for odd and even lengths. 
respectively here in red for odd and in blue for even. To account for finite size effect on the, on the second graph on the right, we look at the dependence of that exponent on the chain length by computing the exponent for triplets of points. So on the first graph, we take all the points to do the uh, linear regression, but on the second one, we only take triplets of points and for each triplet, we associate with it a, a critical exponent. And doing so, we can see that um, in both cases, the exponent is linear in one over M. So we extrapolate linearly at the thermodynamic limit, which correspond to the y-intercept. And we obtain 3.2 and 2.7 by accounting that way for finite size effects for even, respectively, sorry, even and odd chain lengths. However, um, at low momentum, um, there is still a, a first excitation for that sector, and it is rather in the zero total spin sector for even chain, chain length. So um, to come back, the real first excitation had a total Z spin of one for uh, even spin chains and at a momentum close to pi. But uh, now we're looking at another excitation that has a higher energy, um, and that is the lower excitation with low momentum. So it's in the total Z spin equal to zero, like I was saying. And this time the behavior is, is much more similar for odd and even spin chains, uh, even chains length, sorry. Using the same extrapolation scheme, we obtain an exponent, we obtain two exponents that are both really close to 2.7. So I'll now summarize uh, our results for the dynamical exponents for both chains. Uh, for the Kawasaki spin chain, um, Greenberg found an exponent close to 3.1 in the low temperature and high coupling limit for even lengths. Um, however, the uh, just quick, uh, Gabriel, just a quick question: yeah. Did Greenberg do odd chains? No, he did not. Um, and like like I will be seeing uh, in a, in a little while, almost all the literature on the Fredkin spin chain only uh, inspects uh, even length, also for the Fredkin one. Mm -hmm. uh, we did both of them. But so do we have do we have finite size results for Kawasaki odd? No, we don't. Length? We did we not look right, at that. We didn't look at uh, large kappa, for example. Right? Exactly. We don't have those spectrums. Mm. Personally, Green, Greenberg did, a, did them for uh, event length chains. Did that answer to the question? Yes, thanks. And do you have an explanation for the difference between n even and n odd? For, for the Fredkin one? Yeah. Yeah, we're not sure, but it could be because uh, for the Fredkin one, uh, its momentum is right on pi, so it has a, a special momentum. So it could be a state that um, behaves uh, kind of that that needs an even length to to be able to to exist because of the I don't know how, how to say that, but how the how we can align spins and have certain patterns only for even lengths. Um, because for uh, odd lengths, do you even have k equal to uh, pi? No, it doesn't exist. You cannot yeah, exactly. have that momentum. But if you take longer and longer chains, you'll be able to get closer and closer, but yeah. you'll never but I mean, be able to have it exactly. To answer Stefan, maybe you can also show this uh, slide where we talk about the special ground state for even chains. Yeah. Yeah, this is a state that only exists for uh, uh, can, let's, uh, here. Yeah, well, we did not show it, but there is a ground state that only exists for even length spin chains because it allows for patterns that you cannot have for uh, odd length. And with the same k, right? It's k equal to pi, Ivan. Yeah. As the excitation. But so Corretin. He gives the exact form. Can you describe the, the form of the special ground state for even chains? Uh, it, it's li like Stefan said, it's quite involved and it involves special, spe uh, special coefficients and some uh, re re uh, states that are representation of certain um, group of correspondence. And um, 
uh, yeah, you can go and see in the paper for but, uh, if you it's, want. Uh, so it's not equal weight superposition in no, the kind of basis. No, it's not equal. If it was simple, we would have put it in the slide, but it, it would have taken a while to explain every symbol that appears in it. Okay. So no, it's not, it's not symmetric. <laughs> Um, to come back to where I was. Thank, thank you for the question, by the way. So yeah, here I was. So um, I said, uh, yeah, like I said earlier, um, using the dynamics of the corresponding classical spin chain for the Kawasaki spin chain in the low but finite temperature uh, limit, uh, it suggests that the exponent in the weakly polarized sector should be three. So I, I've put it in there too. And um, if you want more information on that, you can look at the second uh, article there from Bray, and or you can look at our article too, we talk about it. And in the two magnet sector, finally, for the Kawasaki spin chain, the dispersion that Stefan presented earlier indicate an exponent of two, and we verified it uh, using the spectrum for different lengths, and we indeed obtain an exponent of two. Now for the Fredkin spin chain, uh, using the exact diagonalization with periodic boundary conditions, we found 3.2 for even length. And this result actually corresponds to the one from Adikari and Chen, which were both obtained with fixed boundary conditions, so a different boundary condition, and uh, they respectively used uh, Monte Carlo and DMRG. And they, they, they find the same uh, result as us. For odd lengths, we find an exponent lower, close to 2.7. And the first excited state, however, was not in the low momentum sector. And for odd lengths, there are, it's the first time that it was done in literature, as far as I know. And so for low momentum in the even case and in the odd case, we found an exponent again close to 2.7. And for the even case, uh, this excited state had a total Z spin of zero, and it was actually the lowest excited state in the sector with total Z spin equal to zero. And that was uh, actually uh, add its uh, dynamical exponent calculated again by Chen and his collaborators using a DMRG and a fixed boundary condition. And their results coincide with ours once more. And finally, in the two magnet sector, again, the dispersion indicates an exponent of two. So both in the Kawasaki spin chain and in the Fredkin spin chain, uh, we see that there are multiple dynamics at work. I will now be talking about um, the universality, uh, well, the level statistics. So the next question we'll, we will tackle is the one of integrability. To know if the system is integrable, uh, one needs to find all the symmetries of the system. However, you, you probably know that it's nearly impossible to formally prove that we found all of the existing symmetries, even for some complicated one dimen dimensional systems like ours. Fortunately, we can study the spe spectrum instead to know if the system should or not be integrable. Our goal is to use the Berry Tabor conjecture to determine if it's integrable or not. To do so, we need to look at the unfolded and disymmetrized spectrum. To disymmetrize the spectrum, we need to uh, use the, well, we use the block basis to compute the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian in each momentum and total Z spin sectors. Doing so uh, allows, even allows for a faster computation of the spectrum as it will separate the Hilbert space in many fragments. Um, now, and so the spectrums we will have will be disymmetrized because it will be characterized by a momentum, a specified fixed momentum and total Z spin. Um, what, what does it mean to disymmetrize the spectrum? Yeah. It means that you, you want to look at the, all the energies that will have uh, the same moment, the same quantum numbers for all the other possible quantum numbers. So in our case, in, in most sectors, it's gonna be only the momentum and total Z spin. So we're looking at all the energies that will have a, a fixed uh, momentum like zero and a fixed total Z spin like let's say one. 
And so it's like energy. it's like blood diagonalizing the Hamiltonian it's using exactly, the quantum. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's exactly that. Is and, that a new word that you for, uh, invented, <laughs> or it's in the lit literature? No, but it, it's it more was, uh, it's more specific. Maybe Gabriel can describe the procedure a bit. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, for it. Yeah, it was in the literature. The the um, the articles in in particular will be at the end. But there's uh, what you're talking about, William. The the more specific part is more about the unfolding. So may, maybe uh, I could have chosen better words. But uh, disymmetrizing is it's really because we we take off all of the symmetries because as we will see later in some um, symmetry sector, well in when we have some value of the quantum numbers like momentum equal to zero, actually we'll, we will have some extra, extra symmetries to account for like uh, the uh, space inversion symmetry. And in those sector, we need to further block diagonalize the Hamiltonian and look at the spectrum in the smallest block possible. The, does it answer to the question? For the disymmetrization, yes, but I'm looking forward to the unfolding. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, for the unfolding, um, to unfold the spectrum, we use a method that is presented by Kudo and Degushi. Their article will be, will be in the reference. And it uses a spline interpolation to renormalize the energies such that the local density of state is equal to one. And we do that to, to uh, probe the, um, the universal properties of the Hamiltonians. Um, this this procedure was uh, was uh, studied in context uh, in the context of random matrix theory and for random matrix theory actually um, it's exact it's 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 known it works for the uh, Hamiltonian systems well it's a conjecture and it's the Beritabor conjecture. Finally, what we will look at is the distribution P of S, which is the probability that adjacent unfolded energies with, will have a spacing of S. So, like I said, according to the Berry Tabor conjecture, well, P of S should be either an exponential distribution if, uh, if the system is integrable and the uh, exponential distribution is uh, the distribution of a Poisson process. And it indicates that uh, some symmetries were not taken into account. On the other end, if the system is not integrable, the spectrum will exhibit level, repulsion, and rigidity, and the distribution will be the Wigner surmise from the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble of random matrix theory. To determine whether our obtained distribution is exponential or Wigner, we will fit it with a linear combination of the two using a parameter alpha that will be one for Poisson distribution and zero for Wigner distributions. Um, here I'm showing uh, what we obtained for P of S for a specific sector, that is for the Kawasaki spin chain with kappa equal to 0 0.5, n equal to 24, total z spin of one, and momentum of 2 pi over 24, which is the first non-zero uh, momentum. The value of 0 0.5 for kappa is chosen because it is uh, far from both limits. So it's far, from, far enough from zero and far enough from infinity. And in this symmetry sector, um, we have over 100,000 100, states. So it's a large sector. And because of that, we get a rather smooth histogram as shown here. Um, it's, uh, it's Distribution is clearly Wigner with a fit coefficient uh, alpha of 0 0.02, which indicates non integrability according to the Berry Tabor conjecture. I've shown with a dashed line the Poisson distribution that starts at one and goes to zero. And with a dotted line, I've shown the Wigner one that starts at zero, which we're really close to. Uh, we observe the same uh, similar distributions for other chain lengths in other symmetry sectors and for other values of kappa. And even for, we obtain the same thing also for the Fredkin spin chain as we will see in the next two slides. So could I just ask something? Uh, 
yeah, the, sure. The, the rising, so the non-integrable curve. Uh, I'm just trying to. I'm more familiar with random matrices, but uh, also it's been changed. But but the uh, it looks vaguely like the level repulsion curve for random matrices, but that's not what you're representing there, is it? Um, I wouldn't. No, I don't think so. But I'm not really familiar with the random matrix theory. I read a little bit about it, but I'm not familiar at all. But you can show the previous slide for John, uh, the exact functions, yeah. this distribution or this function. Oh. Could you remind us what's the S, the variable S? It's the it's, spacing, but be more precise. Is the spacing between uh, unfolded energies, so between energies that were renormalized so that we have a density uh, of one. But then, I mean, random matrices, that's what we mean by spacing distributions. You're looking at the spectrum yeah. of a random matrix, and there's level repulsion. John, we don't hear you. John, we lost you. Yeah, no, something like that. The, the, he's back, uh, he's back. back. John, we hear you now, but we didn't hear you for one minute. minute too. But it's, I mean, there's no explicit curve uh, like what you have there, which looks like a, a sort of, uh, well, it looks like a Gaussian and a linear term. So, so that's certainly not what it is, but it has a shape similar to that. So it's probably not the same thing. I took that uh, that function from the literature. Uh, did, did I answer the question? Well, I think I, I did the most I can for, for answering that question. Well, there is some kind of level repulsion that this represents, but I don't know exactly what. Uh, I mean, the energies that are repelling here are not the spectrum of a random matrix. So it's a different uh, context. Yeah. It does have a similarity. Yeah, it's a local Hamiltonian that's invariant under translations. So it's, it's very far from a random matrix. It has more structure. But it's just a local quantum Hamiltonian and spin one half. <clears throat> But, yeah, um, but you have a lot of, of energy levels and and they're uh, they're satisfying this kind of distribution so uh, this is the distribution of the spacing of two consecutive ones right yeah exactly okay. so now what i'll be showing is um the co fit coefficient alpha but um yeah, um, the fit coefficient alpha, sorry, in all of the symmetry sectors of the Kawasaki spin chain. And after that, I will do it for the Fredkin one. So here um, I've omitted negative momentums and negative total Z spin sectors because they have the same value as their positive counterpart because they have the exact same spectrum because of the symmetries of the system. Um, could, could I also just intervene because I, I'm yeah, yeah, familiar yeah. with integrable spin chain. So this Kawasaki one is not integrable? Yeah, well, th that's going to be the conclusion we will, we will show. In, and, like, and the Fredkin the is not integrable? The only one that's integrable is the XXC? Yeah. Bo both of our, our chains are not integrable in, in the, the main symmetry sectors. So I'm just a little bit puzzled because when you speak about beta ansatz, <laughs> that Im implies that you got a, uh, you know, uh, the beta equations, the R matrix equations, and so on, and that usually just means integrability. But you're saying that you have beta ansatz uh, eigenstates, but the system is not integrable. Yeah, well, it is in the one magnon and two magnon sectors, but it is not in the uh, low polarized sectors. So in where we have like as many, a number of magnum that is close to the, the half of the chain length or something like that. Maybe I can also uh, add to this. Um, it's, at least it's my understanding that uh, integrability via the Bethe ansatz comes when from solvability, like complete solvability of the Bethe ansatz, which you get um, via the three magnon sector. And you will always have the one and two magnon sectors um, that you can solve via the Bethe ansatz even um, for non-integrable models. 
but uh, the distinction really happens um, when you consider the three magnon sector. That you haven't done because it's too tough numerically. Exactly, yeah. Well, I mean, numerically you can do it uh, for a small number of magnon, probably three, four, but you cannot, um, you won't have the factorizability as you have for XXX. So uh, the Bete Ansatz, strictly speaking, does not apply to magnon sectors beyond two. So it's, we use the words Bete Ansatz, but it's really the, generic solution for any spin chain with those symmetries has that form. So it's not really bit the answer, it's just. So I'm just a little bit puzzled because you're saying, okay, you have a non-integrable system, but there's a sector in which it behaves. In well, Johnny can always do this bit the answer, quote unquote, for the one and two magnon. It's not bit the answer, it's just the symmetries imply those forms for the one and two magnon sectors. Okay. So the beta ansatz comes in when you have three magnons, four magnons, and that's where uh, the beta form is not general. But you don't have Yang Baxter equations, right? No, we don't. And nevertheless, you have uh, beta ansatz eigens, because I, I tend to identify the beta ansatz with. Uh, but we don't have the full beta ansatz. We don't have the full beta ansatz. Full beta ansatz holds for, for example, three magnon sector for magnon and so forth here it does not apply so you don't so have is there some some invariant quantity like the number of invariants that commute which which determine the degree of integrability well uh, here's not infinite <laughs> well i mean the system you, know, you have like you, you have the, the, genes, the, right? the simple so symmetry is like total sz translation uh, then, as they were saying, you have parity um, or the combination of parity and time reversal. That's only the obvious one. Others. Yeah, you don't have more complicated uh, integral, integral of motions. Yeah, and this uh, energy level statistics, the, the repulsion shows that there is no such, numerically, you know, if you trust the numerics, it shows that there is no such set of conserved quantities. So, Otherwise, you would have Poisson distribution, like you have for XXX. So for Kawasaki, when kappa is zero, you recover XXX spin chain, which is beta integrable, and then that histogram should become the Poisson one. But when kappa is non-zero and finite, not infinite, then uh, well, we have 0 0.5, but similar stuff happens for other finite values. Uh, we find that it's level propulsion and non-Poisson, numerically you conclude that it's non-integrable. And which is consistent with the fact that we don't have the full bit ansatz. We didn't try, but we know that we should not because it won't work. In any case, Gabriel, this uh, spectrum was computed by brute force, not by beta ansatz. Exactly, it was exact diagonalization on a super cluster of computers. So it, it, it would not be more difficult to do the true magnum. Uh, no, but uh, the only the only uh, reason I didn't do it in those slides is because to do it for tree magnum, uh, but, well, to do those histograms, we want to look at sectors that have a large amount of states. So to have a large amount of states in a tree magnum sector, you need a really really long chain. And actually, sadly, my code, the way it's it's done, I cannot look at very very long chains like over 50 or, or so because it will break. But I'm sure someone else could try and do it. <laughs> but you, in your slides, the ones where you have uh, the K versus, no, no, at the end, at the end, the one you were actually talking about before. Yeah, this one, oh, so, okay, so. Actually, we've interrupted Gabriel, maybe you should, uh go on giving the oh, talk and we'll oh, ask questions after well it, it's almost over anyway and we we've covered mostly what i was gonna, going to say on those two slides two last but, slides. but, but just say it so what, yeah. what what are we looking at yeah, uh, we're looking at the fit coefficient alpha in each of the symmetry sectors. So it's going to be white if it's close to Wigner, which indicates non-integrability, and it's going to be rather dark if it's close to one, which 
uh, well, it would be black for one, which would indicate integrability. And we can see that the value of alpha is really close to zero in most sectors, but it increases as we increase total Z spin. And that's only because there are less and less eigenvalues in the histogram. So the histogram is not more Poisson, it's just less smooth. So the fit doesn't work uh, as well as for the other sectors. And uh, I also wanted to say that uh, we observe the same behavior for chain lengths, uh, for lower chain lengths and for kappa between 0 0.1 and 1, and even for the negative 0 0.1 and 1, um, which is the for the anti-ferromagnetic case. Um, we cannot go lower than 0 0.1 or higher than 1 because, uh, well, the numerical pr procedure will, will break. I, I can talk about that if you ask a question about it. And uh, for the Fredkin spin chain, well, we get the same results, uh, but we observe a, a difference for one sector, which is the one with momentum pi over two and total Z spin of zero. This indicates that there's probably an extra symmetry to account for in that sector. However, we can still see that in all the other sectors, the distribution is close to Wagner and hence uh, the Fredkin spin chain and the Kawasaki spin chain uh, should not be integrable. Uh, finally, the last slide, uh, well, because we were interested in the thermodynamic limit, we looked at the scaling of the fit parameter in different symmetry sectors, and we can always see that it's, it gets closer and closer to Wigner as we increase the chain length. Uh, I'll conclude here, and after that, I can answer a few more questions. So in conclusion, we first introduced two critical uh, quantum spin one half chains, the Kawasaki spin chain and the Fredkin spin chain. We solved their one and two magnet sectors using the Bete Ansat. We used those solution, um, using those solutions, we looked at their two magnet dispersion continuum and we identified that uh, it's the same bulk as in the Eisenberg spin chain, but with different branch states. We then look at the dynamical exponent in different regimes, and we notice that both, both chain host uh, multiple dynamics. We also got the same results for the Fredkin spin chain as the ones from Chen and uh, Adikari, which use a different approach and different boundary conditions. Finally, we use the very Tabor conjecture, and we claim that both spin chains are not integrable. So that, that does it for. We can go back to the questions if you have some more. And thank you for your time and attention, everyone. Uh, I, I would, if nobody else does, I, I would have a couple of questions, remarks, whatever. So it's very funny because, yes, random matrices in some sense. Uh, represent the, the, the sort of opposite end chaos uh, of dynamics from uh, integrable systems. But, you know, people who work in random matrices know that there are, when you say Wigner matrices, what, what we call Wigner matrices are just any distribution where the, independ where the individual matrix elements are uh, independent around variables. Uh, and there's this phenomenon of universality, which says that the distribution, the kind of uh, spacing distribution and so on, is actually universal and it doesn't really it really doesn't depend very much on the type of measure probability measure in this case of, in the, of matrices uh, so we have what we call integrable random matrix models and that's what is used to do explicit calculations the, the actual curves we don't have a formula like your s times the gaussian but we do have a, a a way to characterize it in terms of solutions to certain transcendental equations and so on so there is a, a way to calculate it explicitly. And the, and, and the only reason why you can do it is because there are a sub, very small subset of the random matrix models uh, within this universality class, which are called integrable, <laughs> but for different reasons, not because it's, it's non-chaotic, because I mean, it has the same distribution, whether, whether it's integrable or not, it's the same distribution. And so what, what uh, the random matrix people call integral is when you can reduce the number of degrees of freedom from n squared to n. In other words, uh, the measure only depends on, uh, on the conjugacy classes, essentially, so you diagonalize. 
And that is what is referred to as integrable because you can actually do explicit computation for, for those cases. Uh, but it is not integrable in the sense of Hamiltonian integral systems. It's just uh, the notion of reduction of the number of degrees of freedom to a much smaller number. Okay, one other comment. Uh, since I happen to have spent the last 30 years of my career working on both of these things, both integrable uh, Hamiltonian models and random matrix models, I'd like to just make a, an amusing sort of reflection or comment, uh, which is more for laymen than for specialists. But uh, the thing is, why is it that a huge amount of the uh, rigorous results in random matrix theory of the last 25, 30 years were obtained by integrable systems methods. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Um, well, the, okay, so wh why? Uh, the, the, the reason is it's, it's, um, you do not have a fixed measure in when you approach uh, the random matrix theory. You don't have a, a fixed measure, you embed it into a family of measures, which are perturbations of some measure. And typically it's a kind of exponential series, uh, an exponential of a power series type of, of, of uh, well, I mean, the, the weight, the Boltzmann weight or something like that. Uh, and what, what, so what you're looking at is uh, degrees of freedom, which are in the perturbation, which do obey equations like the, KDV equation or other integrable equations. So the perturbations that you put upon these systems are the integrable thing. It's not the thing itself, which is chaotic, but the perturbations in the measure, they obey equations that are typical of integrable systems. And the universality tells you they don't matter. The fluctuations don't matter because the distributions that you're actually calculating in the scaling limit they don't care whether you're in an integrable case or a non-integrable case. Uh, they they are very general. So that that's the why there's a, this big interplay between integrability and random matrices, even though they're at the opposite end of the uh, scale. Okay, that's my comment. So John, just. Uh... To understand better your comment, which I, I think I understand. Let me know if I'm correct. So, um, because here we're checking for integrability in the sense of what you have for the XXX spin chain, where XXX, you have an infinite number of conserved quantities that are each local. Um, and this means that eventually you have uh, the Betty Ansatz that works for all sectors, any number of magnons, you just have this factorizability of excitations and you can just solve the, the quantum system, the entire spectrum of the quantum system, which is a very strong statement. And you have the young baxter equation and so forth. Um, but if you want to look at perturbations around given states and look at what equations uh, these perturbations obey, say in the like, long wavelength limit, where you can write down maybe a continuum. No, William, sorry, uh, not just not to misunderstand. It, yeah. It's not like that. It doesn't work yeah. like that. Yeah. You've got the random system. That's the random matrix. You have maybe a Gaussian measure or something like that. And uh, yes, you can mm -hmm. maybe do explicit calculations for things like level repulsion with a Gaussian measure. Uh, but then you do perturbations where you don't do a Gaussian measure, but let's say uh, some uh, exponential, not of a quadratic polynomial, but of a, maybe not a polynomial, maybe an infinite series or a polynomial of higher degree. The parameters that characterize that series should be thought of as time parameters of an associated integrable system, which is describing the perturbation in the measure. Okay. So the dynamics of the, how the partition function for the random matrix uh, depends on these parameters, that is integrable. That, that obeys the equations of integrable system. It's not the system itself. The system itself is, is chaotic. You're doing kind of 
integral perturbations of a chaos, uh, you're adding something, you're changing something in the probabilistic measure, which is amenable to understanding as a dynamical system, which is integrable. That, that's the way it works. So you're not, it's not that you're perturbing uh, an integrable system. Uh, you're, you're, it's not the it's not the Hamiltonian that you're perturbing. It's the part. It's the it's the measure that you use to define the partition function. Mm -hmm. And how, how would you phrase that when you start with a Hamiltonian, a quantum regular Hamiltonian, not a family of random matrices, which is what we have here? the other way around right you're using integrability to study random matrix ensemble well, in one case whereas... you have a specific hamiltonian which you're diagonalizing and you're looking at the eyes yeah. in random matrix theory of course you do not have well you do have a fact and that is that when you have very big matrices uh, and look at the spectrum of these different matrices uh, they happen to coincide with the spectrum of one big matrix no matter how you choose it generically uh, because that has so many eigenstates, you can do you can do statistics on the eigenstates of one of them, and that's what you're doing re really with your Hamiltonian system. But this, but really, what in the original nuclear physics setting was the uh, Wigner's idea was uh, random matrices. Uh, the the randomness is some uh, contains something that is that is universal, and uh, what was universal was the local microscopic. Uh, density of the eigenvalues, um, and then uh, one has the one you know one one does a sort of stretching of the scale when as you as n goes to infinity and you you take a microscope and you look at uh, sorry one uh, the first was a macroscopic which gave the Wigner sem semicircle law and uh, and that that's not universal but what is universal is when you do the mic when you do the scaled microscopic uh, spectral analysis, the distribution of the eigenvalues don't seem to care on the sort of measure with which you're assigning probabilities to the different matrices. That's that's universality. But I'm just saying that, that there's two ways in which the word integral comes into random matrix theory. A huge, huge number of random matrix specialists are also specialists in integral systems, but they're not solving, for the most part, they're not solving integral quantum systems like the XAZ or anything like that. <clears throat> uh, they're looking at classical uh, integrability, and that describes the dynamics. <clears throat> in a strange way, the partition function for the random matrix system, like for any other statistical system, um, if you subject it to perturbations of a certain sort, uh, it turns out to satisfy dynamical equations that are recognizably integrable, classically integrable dynamical uh, equations. Uh, the other way that integrability comes in is, is really just a question of jargon. It's, it's this business of, of invariance under co conjugation. The fact that the spectral measure is invariant under conjugation is what people call uh, uh, integrable um, random matrix models. They'd sort of fallen out of fashion since the uh, universality results were extended uh, to to matrices which were not in that conjugation invariant category. So that's another notion of integrability. There, the only reason why they use the word integrable is because of the reduction of the degrees of freedom from the full uh, n squared in a matrix to the n in its eigenvalue. So to the, everything is is spectral invariance. So uh, there, there are two things that are coming in. One is the spectrum of the random matrix, and, and in your models, it's the spectrum of a given specific spin chain Hamiltonian. Um, it's not, it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same role of spectral theory. But you arrive. I mean, you you look at then you look at. Uh, I mean, all of you <laughs> look at the um, statistics of the eigenstates. You look at the distribution of the spins and so on. In the eigenstates, and you do you do uh, a statistical analysis, or, or uh, you look at probability distributions of eigenstates being at a certain distance from each other, and so on. And that's exactly the same as what is done with random matrices. Okay. Yeah.
Yes, I have more to learn about classical random matrix theory. But um, thanks for uh, clarifying a different context where you know, this arises. <clears throat> Could I slip in one more question if nobody else is asking before yep. we finish? Yeah. Um, I, I missed, I'm afraid, the first five or 10 minutes of Stefan's talk, so I probably should know this, but but uh, this this question of z-spin, z, the z-spin is some sort of average, isn't it? Some kind of, I don't know, expectation value or something like that? What, uh, can you can you please, the, for the back to the speakers, can you please define the z-spin, please? Yeah, every, so, every state has a Z, has a Z spin. Right. Yes. I mean, um, it's oh. basically your your total magnetization. Um, and we've chosen the Z axis to be your quadratization axis, and so there's a sort of expectation value of the spins in the chain with some probability distribution. But here's um, on. I mean, what they mean by total is Z is the operator which commutes with a Hamiltonian. So it's a state independent statement regarding the conservation of total as z. So the 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 uh, total z spin is not a property of the state, but of the Hamiltonian. So the, the operator is a property of the Hilbert space. Whatever well, the, Hamiltonian the, the you number want to put on the space. Z, 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 the number z is it determined by the Hamiltonian? Oh, the or number z, the, z like the little z. Yeah, the little z, the, the critical dynamical exponent, is that what you mean? The little z? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's different. Yeah, yeah. So maybe uh, Gabriel or Stefan. Uh... Isn't that what you call z spin? Um, no, no, it's not. Um, the So Gabriel was uh, describing it to me. I'll, I'll let him answer this question. But yeah, it's, it's related to the uh, energy gap. But yeah, go for it. Okay, so what you have on that slide is Z, is a yeah. property of, of some given, some particular state, isn't it? Not of that. Uh, yeah, so total Z spin is an operator which has some eigenvalues. So the S, Z, T that is up here is the eigenvalues of an operator for, for certain eigenstates. And um, since we block the diagonalize uh, according to this operator, all of our eigenstates will have uh, will be an eigenstate of that operator. And the other little z that is uh, here on the graph axis, on the second graph axis, and down there, this is the dynamical exponent. So this is uh, this represents how the energy of a state will scale as we take longer and longer chains. But is the little z at the, uh, in the graphs, is that some sort of average over the spins in the chain? No. Does that give a sort of average value of spin? No, 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 it's not, it's not related to the, the z spin axis or anything like that. Okay. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry, is so I'm back to chairing. So, so that was uh, the, the question was answered. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I completely yeah. misunderstood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, if well, I don't know. Uh, one comment is that usually you define a unique z as being the scaling of the uh, total gap. So if you just rank all the energies, not in a given sector, just all sectors, um, you look at how the First excitation goes to the ground state, usually as a power law. You know, for CFTs, the power is one. So Z is one, you know, space and time scale the same way. But here, these are not spin chains that are described by CFTs at low energy. And so Z is not one. Uh, and there's even some dependence between even an odd for the Fretkin one. So it's uh, anomalous uh, dynamics of excitations at low energy, which is not of the conformal type where everyone has equal to one. Um, so the field theory for this, we don't quite know. Okay. 
So uh, just one little backtrack still, maybe yeah. to slip in a last one. This is to Stefan, your part of the talk. When when Ivan was asking you about these, uh, we were confused between G and J. Uh, he was asking you about the G1 and G2 and the E. And you said those are beta parameters, that all of these things are beta ansatz parameters, correct? Yes, I mean, his questions was regarding unknowns and they, they are indeed unknown, yeah. So were those, okay, so, but, but the beta ansatz, I think we agree, only applies to integrable systems, right? The beta ansatz eigenstates. I mean, yes, my, my point is that you can apply this formalism in the one and two magnon sector, um, regardless of whether the system is integrable, but the distinction for integrable system is that you'll be able to apply it for the entirety of the spin chain. And so the spin chain is going to be solvable via this ansatz and not just for um, these two sectors. But uh, as you can see, like for, for the one magnon sector, it's kind of trivial because you have that the translation symmetry um, already diagonalizes the, the subsector. And that's true, like if you took um, the integral system with XXX as well. And, but you could write it in a beta ansatz formalism if you wanted to, you would just have a n coefficients um, and they'd just be equal to um, e to the i k n. Um, so is, is the point that in the non-integral spin chains, there are some beta ansatz states, but it's not complete. Yes, yes, that is correct. Yeah, the Bethe Ansat solution is not complete, but it, it works for um, your one and two magnon sectors. Oh. So, in fact, the word Bethe Ansatz could be safely removed from the talk without any effect uh, on the results because it's there's no Ansatz. It's the form of the wave function. So, Stefan, if you, or Gabriel, rather, slide controller, if you show the slide for the two magnon state, it's general for uh, any spin chain with those symmetries, total SZ and uh, translation. Yeah, the reason why I was confused by that is because I'm used to the like, so-called algebraic beta ansatz. I think Ivan also, <laughs> the, next the algebraic, I mean, the original beta ansatz had to do with, with uh, planar wave functions and, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, boundary conditions, but it was converted, of course, by lots of people like Cody Eppin into an algebraic form, which was sort of a quantum version of the inverse scattering method. And there, the content of the beta ansatz already presumed that uh, uh, you had a certain Yangian algebra or something like that, some solution to Yang's back to Yang Baxter equations, and that you could uh, that you could uh, take a highest weight state and create the eigenstates by applying uh, certain operators in this Yangian to that. Uh, and of course, you can still ask the question whether you'll get a complete set of eigenstates, but that was the algebraic ver version of the beta on this. And it didn't really make sense unless you had a Yangian structure in the first place. But uh, your, uh, whatever, Fred, Fredkin and other models, I guess, don't have a Yangian structure. Yeah, it's the coordinate version. So the CBA rather than the yeah. ABA, and, yeah. Right, so you can still make an ansatz with plane waves yeah. and so on. Yeah. Uh, and maybe the eigenstates, there will be some eigenstates that satisfy. It. Exactly. And that's what you're seeing. No, yeah. I mean, all eigenstates satisfy the, that form and the one magnon and two magnon sectors. It's, it's a consequence of the symmetries for any spin chain. It's, uh, so is it, that really? But the ansatz should be removed, in fact. I mean, I don't know uh, in this context because we're not using the full bit the ansatz. It's, the, the, I, I think you can that form the entirely saturates the sector. It's just based on the symmetries. There's no bit on that uh, of the form you're talking with the young Baxter. So why not just call it Magnon eigenstate? Exactly. I mean, Magnon ansatz. Yeah, yeah. I think that's even better. You can see on the Hamiltonian, the Fredkin one, that uh, it's not uh, emit. I mean, there's a tree, tree triplet interactions. So if you try to uh, get the usual beta on that, um, there's only a pair interaction in the usual XXZ. So this one will be a little trickier when you get to uh, uh, try to get the three magnons. 
Uh, and no, I uh, can't agree you with might you. fail I, to have the real data on Sats well, equation. Ivan, I can't agree with you because uh, yes, the, sp the spin chain Hamiltonian only has uh, quadratic expressions, but if you look at the full commuting set given by the, the trace of the transfer matrix, you've got uh, all sorts of degrees, every degree is possible. I agree with that, uh, uh, John, but writing the beta equation is making sure that when you have uh, nearest neighbor terms, uh, the condition of the equation comes from the pair. Here you have triplets. So I'm not sure you would be able to find uh, algebraic equations that would you, you would be able to call beta ansatz. But, but you agree that in the standard integrable spin chains, there are commuting elements which are cubic, quartic, whatever. Absolutely, but they play no role in writing up the beta equations. And, and the nearest neighbor part is also not essential. The Godin model is integrable, but it's it's uh, long range. <laughs> that I, I agree, but I, I understand what Stefan says that hey, by miracle, when there's only two magnum, I can write equations that I unfortunately call betons as equations, but I cannot do it in three uh, magnum. So I understand the statement now. And by miracle, it, miracle replaced by symmetry. By symmetry, you can write down this ansatz, which completely saturates those trivial sectors. So it's just just physics with symmetries. It's not with the ansatz in this uh, full-fledged form as you have for XXX. Well, if, if I may just uh, chime in, you can always call, it's a question of terminology. You can call this an ansatz. An ansatz is an ansatz. It's a hypothesis. You make, you suppose the solution takes that form, but then you you need, then you make the ansatz. Then the procedure in the coordinate beta ansatz is that you need to get to the beta equation, the conditions that comes from the uh, the boundary terms, and then you 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 must need to make sense out of it and be able to solve. And uh, this might not work here, but you can always make the ansatz. It's, it's just a word. And John is right. Of course, if you work in the algebraic form, you have the transfer matrix, but this is, you, you know, if you have an underlying Yangian symmetry, then it, it explains the integrability. And uh, then the, the ansatz or the algebraic beta ansatz method is ingrained into this uh, symmetry. But in this, the, you know, the original historical uh, beta uh, ansatz that beta made, it, this is what is being used here, but it just hits a problem when you reach the uh, higher magna on the sector. I, I think it's, we're, we're talking about words here. There's definitely words that can be removed. <laughs> it's well, so I, I agree, you can make the ansatz, but you can deduce the form by symmetry. There's no need yeah, to yeah, deduce sure. anything. It's yeah, entirely yeah. fixed by symmetry. So yes, you can use the ansatz from someone else or guess it, but that's not the right way of doing it. Just by symmetry, deduce the form and solve it. So at no point does one need to guess anything in those sectors. Bete's historical paper, the genius was that it, this ansatz for higher sectors, it's an ansatz, it works. Here, doesn't work. Because for the other sectors, if you write by symmetry, then it, you know. It, uh... But I'm just curious. Did, did you try it? Did you try the three magnon? I don't know. Can you push it? Well, yeah, one can try to write down the generic wave function at three magnon sector and try to solve it numerically and solve it numerically. But we didn't do it. Uh, Gabriel can do it for you know chains up to twenty five by brute force. But if you just specify for three magnons, you can probably go to longer chains. But we didn't bother because. Once we knew that the spectra was Wigner, uh, we, we've lost hope in simple solutions in three and above magnon. But maybe by magic, there's a solution in a three magnon sector, but fails for higher sectors. But we didn't, uh, we didn't try to push it for those uh, low magnons. Yeah. We don't have much hope. Is it clear that even though you would get equa uh, algebraic equations, it would be easier to solve these equations than 
computing the matrix and solving it and getting all the eigenvalues brutally. It's, it's not, these equations are not usually very easy. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, no, it's not obvious. But I mean, Gabriel is working in fixed sectors of symmetry when he's doing the full matrix. So maybe that's the most one can do. Uh, but we haven't pushed the numerics for a given sector that far. I mean, one can go more than 25 spins for three magnons. Right, Gabriel? Yes, absolutely, but we didn't go that way. Yeah, because I don't know what's the estimate, but he can go, I don't know, I guess 100 spins at least or something. The uh, matrix can... size you can estimate them. But it's bigger than what we have. Uh, we just didn't push it. Okay, I'm going to interject something that I probably will regret having said, but just before we finish, um, I heard the word magnon not in the context of uh, spin chains, but in the context of strings and super young mills theory where there were certain uh, methods borrowed from integrable systems that were applied to calculating something which people called the uh, giant spin magnons i don't know if you guys are familiar with that but it's the same word and i think it's also it's not spin chains because they're not talking about sl2 they're talking about the underlying group is something like the con the four-dimensional conformal group but anyway it's 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 called giant spin magnons. And uh, Yvonne, this comment is partly aimed at you. I was at a conference at the Perimeter Institute, which, which dealt with all these things. And uh, at that time, the methods that they were using had to do with solutions to the sigma model equations with values in some Riemannian symmetric spaces. And so they were using our work, your, you know, the stuff you wrote for your thesis. Uh, about uh, these uh, kind of multi soliton type solutions of um, sigma models with values in Riemannian symmetric spaces, and they were calling those giant spin magnons. So there's another connection with integrability that would not have been expected. Did you know that, Ivo? No, I didn't. <laughs> So they're calling our solutions uh, super magnons. In any case, sorry, I have to go. So <laughs> thank you for uh, all the discussion, it was fun. Thank you, Ivan. But uh, maybe it's also a good time to thank the speakers. Uh, they want to drink some champagne at this point. So thank you, Stefan and uh, Gabriel, for a very nice joint talk. Uh, merci à tout le monde pour uh, les questions et avoir écouté. And uh, we'll see you next week at the same time.